He was a photographer, a writer, a producer, and a director. But above all, he was an artist. I think Kubrick's visual genius. He could com compartmentalize his mind in a hundred places and be able to summon up, you know, with, his, like, with free hovering attention, boom, boom, whatever he needed to recall from his pre-conscious. Stanley was born in the Bronx. He was born of a family of a uh, doctor, a uh, second-generation immigrant from Poland. Dr. Jacques Kubrick gave his son a camera, which became inseparable from the fledgling photographer. He was soon capturing indelible images of life around him. On his way to school one morning, he went past a newsstand, and the newsstand announced President uh, Roosevelt was dead. Stanley thought, gosh, what a great picture. He took the picture and didn't go to school, uh, went home, developed the picture, and took it straight to Look magazine. The editor not only bought the photograph, but went on to hire Stanley as Look magazine's first and only apprentice photographer. Kubrick shone as a photojournalist, and after a few years, he set his sights on making movies. The short films that Stanley Kubrick made were really an extension of his photojournalism. They are the films of a man whose visual style was formed very early on through still photography. Kubrick now felt ready to tackle a true feature film. He got a cast and crew out to California where he produced and directed a war drama titled Fear and Desire. Even then, Kubrick understood what you needed to make a successful movie, and he inserted a fairly sexy scene with a, an actress named Virginia Leith, who is uh, tied up to a tree and then menaced by one of the men, played, in fact, by Paul Mazursky, who now, of course, much better known as a film director. Uh, so when he came back, he had the ingredients of a very successful commercial film. I first met Stanley Kubrick back in the very early 50s. Uh, when I was at the Signal Corps making Army training films. We were being trained to be combat cameramen. We would take home the, the cameras from the Army and, or rent them and, and do some experimental work. And, and one of the weekends where we were shooting a short subject, actually at, at my family's apartment, uh, Stanley came to visit. To us, he was already a professional. He was already a, a proven filmmaker, having done two short subjects in, in Fear and Desire. Fear and Desire inspired Kubrick to tackle a more ambitious project, Killer's Kiss, which dealt with a boxer on the eve of a big fight. He drew on familiar New York City neighborhoods and friends. I thought he had done a, a terrific job, uh, bearing in mind that he did everything himself. He was the cameraman, he was the, the director, he was the editor. He shot it all silent and then dubbed in all of the, the voices afterwards. I mean, an incredible technical job. Uh, and actually sold the picture to United Artists for $75,000. And I, I asked him what, he, what his plans were for the future, and he said he has no plans. He doesn't know what to do. Um, United Artists said if, if someday he has another project or something, they might be interested. Um, so I said, you know, I've always been interested in, in producing films. He was a producer looking for a project, and he was a, a director looking for a producer. So we, right then and there, we said, we'll, we'll call it Harris Kubrick Pictures Corporation, and uh, we're in business. And so that night, I went to a bookstore called Scribner's on Fifth Avenue in New York and wandered into the uh, Mystery and Western section and came across a book called Clean Break. From the flyleaf, it described it as a story of the robbery of a racetrack. So I bought the book and, and took it home and read it, and, and I got quite excited about it. I love the structure of the book that dealt in these flashbacks. I gave it to Stanley the next day, and he read it immediately, and he thought the same as I did about it. As it turned out, it had already been optioned by Frank Sinatra. But fortunately, Frank Sinatra let the option lapse, and Jimmy, no fool, then or now, grabbed it, got the rights, then worked with, uh, with Kubrick on putting together a screenplay. The Killing was not a very successful movie in commercial terms, but it drew attention to Kubrick. A lot of people saw it, and a lot of people who were very advantageous to him. People like Kirk Douglas, Marlon Brando, uh, saw the film at, at private screenings, and, and they kind of noted him down as a, as a comer. Kubrick soon found himself directing a major star in the 1957 movie Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory was Stanley Kubrick's first international film. A characteristic camera movement of Kubrick's was to keep the camera continually tracking along so that it gave a great sense of depth and urgency. 
to the shot, to the sequence that he was filming. Again and again in this uh, director's work, you find that wonderful sense of a camera that is a dynamic camera. It was an anti-war film, which put it in the category of an art film. And Kirk was really marvelous in being the, the champion of that picture. We can really thank Kirk for having the wherewithal and the uh, desire to get this picture made. Fate and Kirk Douglas would again intervene. Spartacus had stalled when its star and the director Anthony Mann had clashed over style. From a motel near their Death Valley location, Douglas phoned Kubrick on a Friday night to offer him the director's chair, if he could start on the Monday morning. So Monday morning, he's brought on the set and introduced to Laurence Olivier and all these other people, all right, this is this guy that's going to take over this movie. But for Douglas, of course, Douglas thought this was a guy he could manipulate. Kubrick immediately began imposing his stamp on the film, and Douglas loathed it. Kubrick just ignored it to the extent that, as is famously recorded, uh, uh, Kirk Douglas said, Stanley Kubrick is a talented shit. The effect of Spartacus was that Stanley was determined that he would never again work for anyone except himself. During the production of Spartacus, Kubrick and Harris purchased the rights to Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. We read it together and, and both agreed that we, we must do this. We couldn't get conventional financing because no major studio or distributor would take a chance. And you couldn't get any guarantees from the MPAA. So it became a question of me finding a way to get it made independently. On his way to seek financing in Europe, Harris stopped in New York to visit an old friend, Elliot Hyman. I told him about Lolita and he said, how much do you need? I didn't really know, but I said, I think Stanley and I need a million dollars. And he said, you got it. Harris set up production in England. Kubrick wanted a climate more tolerant than America's, and even more importantly, an intellectual atmosphere less obsessed with deal-making than Hollywood. I went to see Paths of Glory in the local cinema, and I was absolutely devastated. I thought it was one of the great films, and my palms were sweating, I thought. And I thought I would... And I knew that Kubrick was coming to England to do Lolita. So I wrote him a note and asked if I could work with him. And he interviewed me. I came to meet him, and the first thing I asked him is how he saw the film was to look. And he said to me, it's a, it's a very risque story, this, and I'd like it to have a gloss, like the MGM pictures. And I did some research, and I found out that uh, Culver City, where MGM are, use special filters for their black and white films, and I got hold of a set of these filters. Lolita was an amazing film for its time. Mason gives a beautifully balanced performance. And of course, Stanley managed other actors in the film, like Shelley Winters, to get them to give one of their best performances in a completely different key from those that they'd given in other American movies. But his great find was Peter Sellers. And Stanley realized he was working in Peter Sellers with a comic genius, a man who could not only speak the words as written in the script, but could speak better words that he improvised whenever he got inside the skin of the character through several roles inside one film. Stanley used to tell me that Peter Sellers was one of the greatest experiences of his directing life. He found a man who was on his own wavelength. The cast completed Lolita, and it became a critical success. Kubrick's reputation was now firmly established, and he set his sights on subject matter that would become a familiar theme throughout his career, war. For more than a year, ominous rumors had been privately circulating among high-level Western leaders that the Soviet Union had been at work on what was darkly hinted to be the ultimate weapon, a doomsday device. In many of his films, he favored the idea of a narrator who would either introduce the film or else who would comment on the action. Stanley believed that that was a good shortcut to telling the audience things that would take much longer to show them visually. As with Lolita, Kubrick's mind's eye began to shape an inspired story. He found in a book called Red Alert by Peter George what Stanley considered to be a very strong dramatic story. Kubrick began to adapt the book to a dramatic screenplay, but every time Harris came to New York to work on the script with him, something strange would happen. It really started to make us laugh a lot, and then of course there was that silence when we looked at each other and said, do you, do you think that this could really be a comedy? The script of Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, became a comedy, 
and Kubrick's business relationship with James B. Harris ended in the winter of 1961. The film would be financed by Columbia Pictures. Part of the price of giving Kubrick the money, Columbia demanded that he use Sellers again, who'd been such a success in Lolita, they felt. And they, he had to also appear in multiple roles. That was the deal. So Peter loved that idea, and he loved improvising. It was his first real opportunity to develop characters while working. Because although he had had the experience in Lolita of doing that, much of Lolita was already scripted. With Kubrick at the helm and Sellers attached to star, the cast and crew of Dr. Strangelove would spend six months creating what would become a cinematic masterpiece. He knew most of the technical functions. This questioning mind of his wanted to uh, find out what makes me tick. So he was standing behind me, and I'll never forget one day he said, now I know how you come up with these ideas because you take all your lines to one point. And I said, Stanley, that's known as a vanishing point. It's purely a help, but it doesn't create the design. When I came up with a doodle of a triangular shape, he then asked me, isn't a triangle the strongest geometric form? And without hesitation, I said, yes, you're absolutely right. He said, so how are you going to treat the surfaces? And I said, reinforce concrete. As we... Oh, so it would be like a gigantic bomb shelter. And so he accepted it. The battle scene, I mean, Stanley wanted it played as, as real as possible, you know. In other words, he wanted handheld cameras. First of all, we wanted it to look different. And we wanted so, to use uh, orthochromatic stock if we could get it. Well, I did find, I found 70,000 feet at the RAF of Stanmore. And we used it. Now, I dressed up with full uniform on, and so did Stanley. We both took our flex cameras and we went in the long grass. We mustn't let ourselves be exposed to machine gun fire or anything. And we did the whole battle sequence like that handheld. We shot the whole attack on Burbison Air Base with a handheld uh, Aeroflex himself because Stanley wanted that sort of documentary look for that scene. He uh, scared the hell out of the executives. The world did not know what to do with Stanley, so as a default, they applauded. And it turned out that it was the right thing to do. And I hold my memories of Stanley. Uh, it was a great privilege. And good night, Stanley. <laughs>